Hey guys, thank you so much for being with us this morning here at Wellspring. Um, we, uh, since we've got a kind of a holiday weekend here, we got some, or we got just some people out of town, some of our worship leaders. So we're going to do uh, some recorded songs uh, this morning, like we did in weeks past, and uh, getting ready for us to be all back together next week. So go ahead and join us with worship right now. Hey guys, we've got uh, several things we want to share with you this morning. Uh, first of all, just some exciting news. We have a, a new uh, child born into Wellsprings family this week. So uh, congratulations to Camden and Jessica Taylor, the birth of their daughter, Amelia Catherine, on May 12th. So welcome, Amelia. We're excited to meet you, hopefully, sometime soon. Um, also, just in general, wanted to continue to just really thank you guys for just your faithful giving throughout this uh, these last couple of months with us not being together here. You guys have done a, a great job of continuing to just be faithful and generous um, in our giving. When we've been able to kind of navigate this time um, very well, um, and it's allowed us to, to really be generous in giving money away to other people. So just want, really want to say thank you. I know that's not the story of many churches uh, around our country who are having to make some tough choices during this time. So we at Wellspring, our board, our staff, just really want to thank you for your faithfulness. Just ask for you to continue uh, to keep it up. You're doing a great job, and we really appreciate that. So today, I want to spend uh, a couple minutes here really uh, walking you through what the next uh, week is going to look like for us as we um, plan to reopen uh, next Sunday morning. So I want to share with you what that's going to look like. And just before I dive in, I just want to remind all of us here, um, obviously, that we, um, when I say we, I mean myself and the board, um, we're just doing the best we can. Um, as you've watched over the last couple of months, we know that there are all kinds of opinions, politically, medically, um, on the national and local level, about what we should be or should not be doing. Um, and so, you know, just want to ask you to continue to be gracious towards us. Um, we're not always going to get it right. We may have to change our minds um, in a couple of weeks, depending on, on different factors. So just want you to be praying for us and just believing the best about us and just being, um, I guess, just supportive um, during this time as well. And I mean, as we all know, it's really your choice about whether you um, choose to come and be a part of this um, service with us um, in some form or fashion the next couple of weeks. So just use your best judgment on what works for you and your family family and maybe your particular medical situations. So what we're going to be doing next Sunday, um, moving forward, we really don't know honestly how many people are going to show up. So we're going to be splitting kind of the congregation in half by, by last name. So alphabetically, A through M and N through Z. So next Sunday, A through M, um, last names, you guys will be allowed to be in the sanctuary. Um, the balcony as well will be open. Um, we do have uh, some other options. We've really spent a lot of time trying to figure out how can we get as many people in and around our property as possible on a Sunday morning. So N through Z, um, next Sunday, we are going to have the East Lawn, so right behind me. Um, we're going to have that open. We're going to have speakers outside that are going to be, you know, pumping out the audio of the worship of me um, speaking. Um, and you're welcome to come, bring lawn chairs, blankets, and just hang out and still be around each other in community. We, we felt like that could be a really cool opportunity also maybe to just minister to our neighbors and for people to kind of wonder what's going on around there. So every other week, that'll flip-flop. So A through M will be in here uh, next week, um, and then the next uh, Sunday, N through Z will be in here, and A through M will be able to be outside if they like. So it'll be a first-come, first-served basis, though, too. So we don't, we aren't really sure how many people we can fit in here. So um, if we have extra space, we can go outside and say, hey, we can let 10 more people in. Um, or if we're doing A through M and we're already filled up, some of those people might have to be asked to, to move outside if we're already kind of overflowing capacity um, for what we can handle right now. So we will have the pews roped off every other row as well to kind of create um, some distancing. The ushers will be helping to make sure that we're staying uh, safely six feet apart. Uh, we'll have one entry that will be um, for, for entry only, one that'll be for exit only. So we'll have signs up on the doors reminding you of that as well. Um, there's lots of opinions on mass. I know some churches that are requiring those. Um, the way we're going to be handling that is we're just going to be asking you 
uh, just to follow the CDC guidelines, which masks are recommended, but we are not going to require you to have one on um, to be here. So um, just use your best judgment, whatever you feel is appropriate for you. So we're also going to be having the community room open and the basement open, which will both of those will have the Facebook live stream of the service. So those are a couple of other options um, that you can uh, partake in if you'd like. Um, and so children has been a big discussion in, in terms of how to handle that. So here's what we have currently. Um, we are going to allow elementary kids um, in the sanctuary um, with a couple of um, qualifiers. So that would be kindergarten through um, fifth grade um, for this school year that they just finished. Um, if you feel like your child, your elementary child, can handle um, the six-foot distancing, social distancing policy, as well as be mindful of sneezing, coughing appropriately, then you're welcome to have your child here. If you're not sure if that's something that your child can handle well, then it might be best to maybe be out on the lawn where that's maybe not as, as big of a factor as being in a little bit more close, closed space. So just use your best judgment. Um, and just to be honest, like we'll, we'll kind of be monitoring the crowd and if there's folks that just aren't handling that well, we might have to ask them um, to find a more appropriate place to be. So. Also, um, children birth through pre-K, we are going to be asking to not be in the sanctuary. We just know with kids that young, their ability to kind of understand social distancing and making choices about coughing, sneezing, and how to handle that is just probably not age appropriate for them. So the basement is going to be a place where we're going to say, hey, if you have families of young children, you want to be down there together, you're welcome to do that. So that's going to be a space for that. And again, you're always welcome to be outside um, with a little bit more of, of open open space for them to roam around. So that is kind of our plan for now. Um, we'll see how it goes numbers wise the next few weeks and make any adjustments that we feel like are necessary. So just be patient with us. We're, we really don't know what the turnout's going to be or how this is all going to flow. Obviously the outside space is kind of weather permitting as well. So we'll do the best we can and uh, we'll still be Facebook live in it. You can stay home if you're choosing to do so and still um, you know, keep up with us. We'll also be starting a new sermon series. There'll be lots of, of new things happening next Sunday as well. So I will email all this information out. Please pass this along to as many people as you can if they um, aren't watching this morning. I'm gonna go ahead and pray for us um, as we head back into our time of worship this morning. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for um, just who you are, God, and that, that doesn't change as we've talked about, Lord. We, we come this morning to honor you because you're worthy of our time, our attention, our affection. Um, God, we just turn our whole hearts to you. We want to, to know you. We want um, to receive from you, but we also want to give um, all of our love, our energy, um, our desires to you. Um, so, Lord, we come wholehearted today and pray that you would help us to connect um, to you as much as we can through this format today. Um, we long to be together. We're excited for um, the movement back towards that. Uh, for those that uh, can come and be with us, we're um, looking forward to that, Lord. So give us grace for one more week here today. And, um, Lord, we just give you this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks again for joining us today. I want to begin by kind of uh, clearing up some confusion that has taken place in the lives of many uh, Wellspring members the past week. Um, my family and I received lots of messages um, asking if I was the one playing drums last Sunday. And so I want to assure you all that it was me and that I am, in fact, Justin Amos, even though my quarantine self haircut just threw a massive curveball to many of you guys. Um, I promise you, I am one of your pastors. I'm not some random stranger that Bob picked up on the street this morning on his way to church. So I know that's just caused immense anxiety in the lives of all of you. And so hopefully you guys can have some peace of mind and be able to rest now at night. So anyway, enough of the nonsense. If you have been joining us the past um, several weeks, you know that we have been on a journey discussing um, Jesus's rhythm of holy disengagement. Uh, Jesus frequently walked away from the crowds so that he could have unhurried time with his father. And last week, uh, Pastor Bob uh, took some time to kind of examine how Jesus prayed along the way. 
how he would pray when he was just going about his life. Um, how he prayed for little children in the midst of the crowds pressing on him. How he prayed during his baptism. And how he prayed um, in front of others for God to raise his friend Lazarus from the dead. Jesus lived out 1 Thessalonians 5.17. It says to pray without ceasing. And not only did he have extended periods of prayer where he would withdraw from the crowds, but he lived in a spirit of prayer because the posture of his heart was one of constant dependence on the Father. And today we're going to approach this topic of holy disengagement by looking at the relationship between prayer and community. We're going to see how Jesus modeled this and lived it out and how we as his followers can follow his example. So let's go ahead and dive in. Open your Bibles or your Bible apps with me to Luke chapter 11. Luke 11. And this is a very well-known passage that I'm sure many of you could recite right now from memory. Luke 11 verses 1 through 4. It says, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into uh, temptation. So the disciples found Jesus praying. And this certainly was not the first time that they caught him engaging God in prayer. And one of them says to him, Lord, teach us to pray. And this is really fascinating because all 12 of the disciples were Jews. They had grown up in Jewish culture, so we can assume that they would have been very familiar and possibly extremely disciplined in their prayer life. Devout Jews would often pray three times a day, perhaps sometimes for extended periods of time, morning, afternoon, and evening. So these men were likely not new or inexperienced to the practice of prayer, and yet here they are taking on the role of a student wanting to learn from their teacher. And before I go any further, we'd like to kind of pause for a minute and try to uh, hear from some of you guys on our Facebook feed. So on your tablet or iPhone or laptop, whatever you're using, um, get on our live stream and write your response to this in the comment. Why do you think the disciples were so intrigued to learn about how Jesus prayed? What do you think they witnessed in Jesus' prayer life that fostered a desire in them to experience that same kind of intimacy with the Father? So go ahead and write your responses to that, and here in a few minutes we'll come back and hopefully be able um, to hear from a few of you guys. So in this prayer, which most of us know as the Lord's Prayer that Jesus modeled, the language itself is communal. The Lord's Prayer is a communal corporate prayer. There's nothing in this prayer that leads us to believe that Jesus is trying to teach them an individualistic or lone ranger approach to their prayer life. And of course we should, and you know, we can and we should pray on our own. There's no doubt about that. Jesus talks about that clearly in Matthew 6. But in this prayer, the one that he gave as an example to his disciples, he says, give us our bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us, and lead us not into temptation. We, us, and our. There's a togetherness in this prayer. It's communal. Jesus is showing that prayer should be done in the presence of other believers, As brothers and sisters in Christ, we approach God together, first to give him the glory that is due to his name, and then we ask him to meet our daily needs. 
And for those of you that have been around Wellspring for a little while now, you might be familiar with some of our core values. We have four core values that we try to live out to the best that we can. Um, And one of our core values is a dependence on corporate prayer and God's word. A dependence on corporate prayer. And while that might be one of our core values, we also have a confession to make. At our um, fall annual board retreat this past fall, we took some time to examine kind of as a leadership team of just how well as a, as a church that we're doing at living out our core values. And it did not take us long to discover that this corporate prayer is the weakest core value that we live out as a church. It sounds so good in theory. We know and believe deep down that it's important, but kind of like Pastor Bob said last week, why is it that when we've tried to hold prayer gatherings or prayer meetings in the past, on numerous occasions, nobody would show up, right? If you want to throw one dud of a party, have a prayer party, right? Nobody will show up. Only the diehards, okay? I've been to some of those meetings. We were lucky if four people came. Maybe five would be a massive turnout. You know, we might say that many of our church members are in a season of life where they just can't commit to attending a monthly prayer prayer gathering, and that could certainly be the case. But it makes me wonder, why is it even in our small groups or in our Bible studies that communal prayer plays such a small role? I know, for example, in in many small groups, my own sometimes, that, you know, we spend the first part, maybe 20, 30, 40 minutes kind of hanging out and catching up. Then we might circle up and gather in, gather around for a time of teaching or discussion. And then by that point, time's kind of slipped away. Some of us have to go home and get the kids to bed or relieve our grandparents, right, of the chaos. Or maybe we got to go study for that college test the next morning. So we throw up a quick, generic 30-second prayer and we go about our way. And I think there are several different reasons why that describes the reality for so many of us. First, like Bob said last week, there's a lack of desperation for God to show up in our lives. We can so arrogantly think that we have the answers and that we can navigate life apart from him on our own strength. I heard a story once of um, a Christian that lives in a foreign country, a very persecuted country, where he's at high risk to be a Christian. In fact, if certain people caught him, he could be killed. And he was doing this interview of some sort, and the guy said, hey, do you ever wish you could come to America? Do you ever dream that you could move to America where your circumstances would be better, where you could worship freely? And I'll never forget his response. He confidently said no. And he went on to say this. He said, you see, in America, you basically have everything that you need, and you can live under the illusion that you don't need God. My daily reality is not like that here. If God doesn't show up for me each day, I might die. It keeps me desperate for him and on my knees in prayer. And he said this, I pray for the American church that they would become aware of how much they need God in their lives. If that's not convicting or at least eye-opening in some ways, I'm not sure what is. So that's the first reason, lack of desperation. Second, like I talked about in week one, I think we often lack a desire to engage God in prayer because we're not confident in our identity as his children. You see, if we believe to the core of our being how loved and treasured we are, then the only response would be to long um, to be in his presence. Who wouldn't want to be in the presence of the one that makes you feel most secure and most loved in this world? And lastly, I think we're tempted to believe that our plans, the teachings we've prepared, maybe the discussion questions that we've come up with, the things that we want to accomplish, we think those are more important than what God might have planned for that meeting at that time and place in history. So corporate communal prayer is an area that we want to grow in as a church. We do not have it all figured out. We are learning and growing in this practice together. Okay, so let's get back to my question. 
from a few minutes ago asking what the disciples must have witnessed in Jesus' prayer life for them to approach him, asking them to teach him how to pray. So, Bob, has anything came through yet? Yeah, we got several comments. Okay. Um, one is that just they had witnessed extreme oneness between Jesus and the Heavenly Father, you know, maybe okay. something they hadn't experienced themselves. Um, Phil Zwering said, I wonder if they saw a genuine conversation and not just wrote tradition, um, you know, not just memorized prayers or things like that. Rob Willoughby said that, that it wasn't out of obligation or a cultural habit, but an actual desire. Um, Jake Davis said, she's Justin has a baby boy and then gets a stud haircut. <laughs> okay. That's kind of irrelevant, but <laughs> just wanted to share that. So that's what we got. <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you, Jake. Great responses, guys. I'm actually going to hit, I think, on all of those here in a minute. So like some of you said, the disciples obviously noticed something different in their own life compared to Jesus' prayer life. Perhaps they were blown away by his dependence on God through prayer. Maybe they were captivated by his passion for the Father. They saw that rich, intimate relationship, like one of you said, and they desired that for themselves. Um, maybe the disciples prayed out of a sense of guilt, a sense of duty, out of a sense of obligation while they saw that Jesus just prayed from a heart of desire, and they knew that they wanted that in their own lives. So let's take a minute now and look at another passage where Jesus emphasizes corporate communal prayer. Open with me to Mark 14, so we're going to go back a little bit in your Bibles or your app. Mark 14 And this scene that we're about to read kind of takes place on um, uh, the night before Jesus was betrayed and murdered. Um, and so he was just experiencing agonizing sorrow, just knowing what awaited him that night. So Mark 14, verses 32 through 40, kind of a little chunk here. It says, They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. It says he took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. Excuse me, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. And going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, um, Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And once more he went away and prayed for the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy and they did not know what to say to him. So Jesus takes his three closest friends, closest disciples with him to the Garden of Gethsemane. He asked them to pray and to keep watch while he kind of walked a little further ahead. And it says that he fell to the ground because he was overwhelmed with the sorrow of knowing what awaited him that night. And Jesus goes back to check on his disciples, I think on three different occasions, one more that we didn't get into. And every time he found them sleeping instead of praying, and I cannot imagine how discouraging that must have been for Jesus. It certainly would be for me. If I knew that I was going to die that night and my closest friends were more concerned with sleeping than being with me and praying for me and supporting me, I would not want to be around them. I'd, be, I'd want to punch them. I certainly would not want to look them in the face. And yet this story is another example of Jesus urging his disciples in the midst of his agonizing pain. He wants them to pray together. What was about to take place was going to change the course of human history. And he wanted them in fervent prayer to God that his will would be done in his life, in their lives, and so that they could be strong and not fall into temptation. And knowing the questions and the wrestling that the disciples were going to have over the next several days, Jesus wanted them to be reminded 
of God's love for them, of their identity, and to be reminded of their mission to proclaim this good news, to proclaim the life of Jesus to those around them. And guys, if I could be real with you for a a moment, um, I want to stand up here in the pulpit and say, I struggle with prayer, okay? I deeply struggle in my prayer life. It is far easier for me to read scripture than it is to engage God in prayer, both personally and corporately. And I know that the root of that lack of discipline is just no, a very little sense of desperation in my life of how much I need God. It's so easy for me to kind of go on cruise control and think that I can handle whatever life is going to throw at me based on my own wisdom or strength or past experiences or whatever it might be. I have missed countless opportunities to commune with the Father and missed out on different things that he's wanted to teach me in various seasons and years of my life because I was too prideful to slow down and listen and also because I falsely believed that my to-do list, my ministry, my job leading others is more important than what maybe he wants to speak to me or to the group of people that I might be with at a given time and a place. And so in some ways, standing up here, I kind of feel like a hypocrite Because I know there are other people in this church who are far more disciplined in their prayer lives and they live with a much greater sense of urgency and desperation to fall on their knees every day before the Father. So just know your pastors don't have this all figured out, okay? I am a work in progress in my prayer life and I know that God has a lot still that he wants to speak to me if I would be more humble and willing to slow down and listen to him. Um, In his book, The Necessity of Prayer, um, I believe we have a quote for you guys. Author Edward Bounds um, said this. He said, desire precedes prayer, accompanies it, is followed by it. Desire goes before prayer and by it created and intensified. Prayer is the oral expression of desire. Without desire, prayer is a meaningless mumble of words. Prayer without desire is a meaningless mumble of words. I would say prayer without desire is no prayer at all. In fact, the opposite is true. Bob said last week, the simple desire to pray is indeed prayer. It is all about desire because you see, we take time, we will make time, we will put in the energy to do the things and be around the people that we desire. If you desire to hunt, you will clear out your schedule and you will buy the gear in order to make that happen. If you desire to impress the guy or or a certain girl, you will clean up your act, right? You might get a self-quarantine haircut. You're going to put the breath mints in, whatever necessary to win that person over. If you desire to have relationships with people in this church, you will do your part to call them, text them, invite them over for dinner. You won't set back and assume it's everyone else's responsibility to pursue you. It's the same with our relationship with the Father. If we desire him, we will disengage from the world to spend time with him, to listen to him, and to commune to him. Desire comes before disengagement. Without desire, our time with God is just going through the motions. He wants our heart. He wants to speak to us to the deepest part of our soul. And in order to do that, he must know that we desire him. He must be given access because he will not force himself on any of us. So let's go back now uh, to Jesus for a minute. We know that prayer was essential to his life, obviously. It was as important to him as breathing. He modeled it well to his disciples. He, He wanted them to live out and understand the importance and the necessity of corporate communal prayer. So it begs the question, how did they do? When Jesus left the earth and ascended back to the Father, what did this look like? Did they keep this practice up of engaging God together through prayer? So let's check it out. Open up to Acts chapter 1. I'm going to skip forward a little bit. Acts chapter 1, the context of what we're about to read is uh, the disciples had just returned to Jerusalem after Jesus was taken to heaven. And it says that all of them 
went upstairs to a room together. And this is what they did in that room. Acts 1 verse 14. It says, they all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. They all joined together constantly in prayer. Let's flip over one page if you're using a physical Bible, or it might be on the same page. Acts chapter 2. Acts 2 verse uh, verse 42. This is the Uh, the disciples and just believers again. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They devoted themselves to prayer. So from the earliest days of the Christian church, from day one, we see believers practicing corporate prayer. We see them gathering in rooms, literally, to pray together. Communal prayer. Their hearts were stirred by rubbing shoulders with their brothers and sisters who had also staked their lives to the King of Kings, Jesus Christ. And hearing the prayers of other believers ignited a fire inside of them to forsake everything so that they might know the living God. And church, there are several reasons why we should desire to engage God through prayer. The first and most important is because he is worthy of our entire devotion. He's worthy of everything that we have and everything that we are. And the second thing is that we need to daily hear the Father's voice voice and be reminded of his gracious and compassionate love for us, his extravagant love for us. And we need to be reminded of the mission that he's given us to partner with Jesus in seeking and saving the lost and sharing his love to a hurting world. When we desire God and turn to pray, not only does it impact us, but it impacts everyone around us. It makes me think of the story of Peter and John in Acts chapter 4. And Peter and John were just preaching the gospel. They were telling everyone about Jesus, and the religious leaders were fed up with it. So they called them to kind of an assembly, put them on the hot spot, Um, And we're trying to get them to tame, you know, to kind of tone it down. And they just kept proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ to these elite religious leaders. And scripture says when they saw the courage of Peter and John, they were astonished. And they took note that they had been with Jesus. People know when we've been with Jesus. And people know when we haven't been, don't they? I know there are times when I'm short, when I'm rude with my wife or with my children, and it is not uncommon, it's pretty common actually, and for her in those moments to say, I think you need to spend some time with Jesus. Why don't you go downstairs for a few minutes and then come back up once you're in a better spot? And guys, the opposite is also true. You know, when we spend time with God, we take on his nature. We become like those that we spend time with. When we spend time with the Father, we take on his character traits, his compassion, his gentleness, his grace, his kindness. Our tone changes, right? It softens. Our perspective changes. We become slow to anger. We don't get so caught up in our circumstances because we know that this world is not our true home. We're able to offer hope and peace to others because we serve a God of hope. He is peace. Guys, let's look at one more passage together before we conclude. Open up to Luke 9, so we're going to go back a little ways. Luke chapter 9. Now, Jesus had just um, predicted his death here. And several days later, about a week later, it's kind of where we pick up in the story. Luke 9, verses 28 and 29. It says, um, about eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went, went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as as a flash of lightning. Bright as a flash of lightning. 
This is one of those bizarre stories in Scripture that just kind of leaves you astonished. Um, we don't have time to get into all of it, but this event is called the Transfiguration. And Jesus' divinity was revealed in this intimate moment where he allowed others to see his true glory. And you can kind of compare this a little bit to think about, you know, in your past or times in your lives where you've kind of been in on a secret, right? You've been in on a secret. You know something or you've experienced something incredible. And so you start kind of bringing people with you to reveal that secret because you want them to see and experience the same wonderful things that you have. And that's kind of what's going on here, but just on a much better, deeper scale. Jesus knew what was going to happen at the transfiguration. And he wanted his closest friends, his three closest disciples, to experience that kind of power and that kind of intimacy with the Father. And guys, the reality is that sometimes we are just not mature enough to even know how to engage God in any type of intimate way. And that is why communal prayer is so critical we need to be around others who have seen God show up and who have seen him do incredible things. We learn from their experience. We're inspired by their passion. They give us a vision of what could be. We're drawn to Christ through the devotion to him. Just being around older saints, people who have walked with the Lord, you know, I, I, I love that saying, a long obedience in the same direction. People who have walked with the Lord longer than we have, they're able to show us how to pray and how to have faith because they've seen God show up in incredible ways and they've walked the journey. They've been in our shoes. Communal prayer is important also because on days when we don't feel like praying, because we will certainly have those days, other people can help fan the flame in us. It's no different than going to the gym and working out, right? If you were to go to Planet Fitness or the college gym or wherever you might work out, if that's your thing, for most of us, if you were to go alone, you're probably not going to work out as intense or as hardcore as you would if you had a friend there with you, right? To keep you accountable, to encourage and push you along. When you see them sweating and grinding it out, you're inspired. It makes you, right, want to do the same thing. It causes you to be driven as well. Seeing them put in the effort pushes you forward to continue the journey and the hard work, even if you don't feel like it in the moment. And guys, I think a reason that many of us often fail at prayer is because we try to go about it completely alone, apart from others. We try on our own strength, and we forget that God wants us to engage him with others. When we approach God's throne of grace together, our hearts are filled with desire to know and to love the true lover of our soul. And so as we close today, maybe you're wondering what you're supposed to do with this. You're thinking, man, this sounds good in theory, but what do I do? You know, if you find yourself with little to no desire to pray, what should you do? And that is a good question. And there's a simple answer. You should pray. We should pray. And here's why it's that simple. I think we have a quote for you. Pastor and author Mark Jones said, habitual prayer tends to give rise to habitual prayer. As our dependence on and desire for communion with our Father grows, the more we bring ourselves into his presence. Constant prayer will foster a desire to pray. So pray, church, when you feel like it and when you don't. Grab a Christian brother or a sister and go to God together in prayer and watch what he will do in your heart. The more we pray, the more our desire to pray will grow and deepen. So I hope today you've become aware of or at least reminded of the important relationship and the necessity of corporate prayer, the relationship between prayer and community. We need God and we need each other. Those two things go hand in hand. Communal prayer helps us connect as believers to engage the living God. Jesus taught it. 
he encouraged it, and our spiritual ancestors, the first Christians, lived it out. And we would be wise to follow in their steps. Guys, there is a beautiful, rich, vast ocean of God's grace and truths to be discovered if we are willing to dive in. Let's not settle for just skimming the surface. When we taste and see that the Lord is good, we will desire to go back to him again and again and again. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for this time. God, we thank you for gathering us, even though we're not together. We thank you for the gift of technology, God, that we can be, in a sense, gathered corporately. God, I pray that you would forgive us of our arrogance and our pride to think that we can handle prayer alone, that we can handle it um, entirely on our own strength, apart from our church, from our brothers and sisters in Christ. God, forgive us of that pride. God, I pray that you would give us desire, Lord, when we don't feel like praying and when we do, help us to pray, God. Foster that desire deep within us to know you, to love you, to be fully surrendered to you, God. We long for intimacy for you, God. Forgive us for turning to other people and other things, God, to meet those needs, those deep desires of our heart, Lord. We want to be a church. We want to be individuals. We want to be a church body, God that practices the discipline of corporate prayer just as you did and just as the early first Christian church did, God. So teach us and grow us in this area of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you all so much uh, for joining us today. Um, Hope you have a wonderful day, and we hope to see some or many of you next week. So thanks, guys, and take care.